Follow your muse, we tell artists. Follow the money, we urge the rest. But what if pursuing our creative tendencies leads us to that hidden treasure? Increasingly, the spark of innovation is driving real economic success in our region. Even as we lament the loss of jobs overseas, a number of imaginative entrepreneurs are adding billions of dollars in benefits to our economy. One of them is a world-famous photographer. The other is building an ice cream empire. Together, they'll explain how to cultivate both passion and profit. I'm Hanson Hossein. Welcome to Four Peaks. Molly Moon didn't start out as an entrepreneur. She spent her 20s working in politics. But then she decided she wanted to be her own boss. But of what? Molly remembered her passion for ice cream and opened her own shop. There are now five Molly Moon storefronts across Seattle. Last year, it was recognized as King County's Small Business of the Year. Yet even as Molly delights Seattleites with her ice cream, she also says that her business continues to embody her politics. Molly, welcome. Thank you. So, Pacific Northwest, known for coffee and for rain and cool weather. What possessed you or inspired you to think that ice cream was the way to go? Well, I really felt like Seattle needed a good ice cream shop. I had lived in Seattle since 2001, and it was 2007, and I was writing my business plan, and I just knew that it needed a good ice cream shop, and an ice cream shop that not only had a great product, but also could be the kind of multi-generational community gathering place that I know ice cream shops in other cities are. So when you look at, say, an ice cream shop versus, say, a coffee shop, mm -hmm. what, what, ga what, what kind of vibe gathers around a, an ice cream shop versus, say, a coffee shop? There is a whole lot more talking in an ice cream shop. Really? Oh, yeah. Because nobody's at their laptops that are staring at there a screen, There are no right? laptops. There's no working. It's all about fun. And there are a lot more two-year-olds involved. Well, that's good. <laughs> so did you think that Seattle needed an ice cream shop because of the ice cream itself? Or did you actually also want to bring that, that cultural ethic as well that was sort of lacking? It was definitely both of those things. I really wanted an ice cream shop in Seattle that I wanted to go to. I'm sort of an ice cream addict. It's my favorite dessert. And I didn't have a place that I would want to go. And I knew a lot of other people would share that sentiment, but also Growing or being in Seattle in my 20s, I noticed that everyone that I encountered in Seattle was close to my age. Right. And that got kind of frustrating to me. And I grew up in a really multi-generational setting where I was always around little cousins or my little sister and grandparents and aunts and uncles. And in Seattle, it seemed a lot more segregated, like families don't hang out where the hipsters hang out, et cetera. So I wanted my ice cream shop to sort of be a place where college kids might go after class, you know, young professionals or hipsters might go on a date, but families could go, families with teenagers could go, and you know, I've, I've been told by a lot of parents that it's one of the only times my teenager will talk to me. Wow. And empty nesters love ice cream too, I mean, it really crosses the generations. I mean, and it, is it just ice cream or is there something about your store that gets people to open up like that? Well, I think I tried to create a really welcoming, fun environment. The, you know, the music is important to me. The design of the space is really important to me. The friendliness of my staff is important to me. But ice cream is a big part. I mean, everybody has a great ice cream memory. That's great. So when you open that first store, what was what were you thinking? I mean, it's. It, I think they were looking at even 2007 or 2008, right? The economy was not in great shape. Actually, it was awesome. When I was writing my business plan in 2007, if you remember, everything felt on the up, and really things didn't start feeling terrible until a month or two after I opened my first shop. <laughs> and how did you feel when you opened your first shop? Sales were amazing. They were much higher than I had projected, and so I just sort of crossed my fingers and kept going. And I also read when I was when I was writing the business plan that ice cream is one of the most recession-proof businesses you can get into. Because it's a 
Because it's a cheap treat. And you know, when you can't buy your kid a new bike or you can't take your family on vacation, I think you're gonna treat them to smaller treats. So you might go to the ice cream store a little more often. Well, that's interesting to me because I think even Starbucks really almost fell off the map at that time. And coffee in many ways is meant to be that indulgence that mm -hmm. makes you feel good. But there must be something really wonderful about ice cream that as you say is much more cross-generational, right? You mm -hmm. can't give your three-year-old a coffee. Right. Well, you shouldn't give your coffee. So. Right, yeah. And I mean, what do you think is more indulgent? A scoop of salted caramel with hot fudge or a latte? So, I mean, you, if, if that's the case, if ice cream is that important, what is, do you have an ice cream memory yourself since ice cream has been part of your life for so long? Oh, absolutely. So when I was a kid, my grandparents watched me in the summers and my mom's parents, John and Faye Pengilly, owned a saloon, like an, a cheers kind of situation, old timey saloon. Where is this? In, in Boise, Idaho. And my mom would drop me off with them in the mornings they would collect the bank deposit from the night before and they had a routine. They, we went to the bank, we deposited the money at the bank, I got a sucker from the drive through teller, then we went to the grocery store. I don't know why they needed to go to the grocery store every day, but they did. And at that point, Grandpa and I would head to the deli section where they had ice cream and Grandma would continue into the store to buy whatever groceries they needed. Grandpa would get a cone of strawberry ice cream on a cake cone and I would get a kid's scoop of German chocolate cake ice cream on a sugar cone every day of the summer, almost my entire childhood. Wow. Yeah. So you've always loved ice cream and you've yeah. associated with that incredible memory. Yeah. So how did you make that conversion in your mind and your soul and your spirit to sort of say, you know what, my love for ice cream could actually be something that I make a living from? Well, I didn't really come up with that idea myself. I was sort of whining to my mom in the fall of 2006. Um, I was still working in politics and I was trying to figure out my next move and she reminded me that I love ice cream and that I know how to make ice cream because I had worked in a little homemade ice cream shop all of my college career at, in Missoula, Montana at a shop called The Big Dipper. And she was sort of reminding me like, Molly, you know how to do this and you would love it and you'd get to be around kids, which is important to me and you could probably make a living at it. It seems like the Big Dipper did really well. So What did you tell her? The I, first I was like, Mom, you, you know, you're the best, of course, <laughs> and you have great ideas, and I'm going to get started on that. Wow, so. so there was no resistance whatsoever. You said, no. I'm doing this. No, it was a great idea. Was it hard to say goodbye to the thing that you actually seemed to love the most before in your 20s, which was politics? No. And how, how did you reconcile yourself then to sort of say, this is my new life? Well, my whole goal getting out of politics, I, I was the executive director of a political nonprofit that worked with bands to register their fans to vote. So it was sort of one foot in the music industry, one foot in, the pol in politics. Neither of those industries are the most wholesome, may I say, yes. at times. And I really wanted to do something a little more wholesome. I wanted to think about putting down roots. I traveled all over the country for that job. And I wanted to do something where I could still embody my politics, but not really be a part of the fundraising rat race and the craziness of the music industry. So it just, it all seemed to make sense. And I knew that I could write a business plan for an ice cream shop that embodied my political values in a number of ways. So how does that work now then? How does politics go into ice cream? Well, when I wrote my business plan, I said, I'm not going to open it unless I can run it in a way that makes me feel good about all of my politics being involved. For instance, I am going to pay 100% of the health care premiums for all of my employees. And I'm going to use only compostable materials to serve everything in. And I'm going to use only reclaimed wood for everything that I can possibly use in the shops. I'm going to build my shops as green as I can. I'm going to be as socially responsible as I can and environmentally responsible as I can with all the ingredients sourcing. That's expensive. This is what a lot of business people complain about that the government imposes upon them. And you did this willingly. Yeah. And you're making money? Well, I sort of said to myself when I was writing the plan that I would write the plan the way that I really wanted to run a business. And if the numbers at the bottom of the plan turned out black, I would go ahead. If they turned out red, I was going to have to stay a political consultant.
and they turned out black. They were black. And I opened my first shop in Wallingford the spring of 2008, and I did way better than I thought I would, and we've continued to do, you know, we've really continued to exceed projections. You have stores in Wallingford, Capitol Hill, Queen Anne. Uh, Madrona, Madrona. And downtown. And downtown. Relatively all. And an ice cream truck. An ice cream truck going all over the place. Those five locations are fairly affluent areas. Mm -hmm. When you consider your politics, which really is about, you know, being an all-encompassing um, kind of situation, why don't you have a store, say, in the Central District? That's a really good question. I mean, I did my, my market research about where ice cream sells, and I went to those neighborhoods. And those neighborhoods are, you know, higher than average household income, higher than average kids per household. So those are the zip codes I'm in. Um, I'd love to be in some other neighborhoods, but I needed to establish my business to be strong financially first in order to expand into areas that may not be as profitable. And, but you probably will at some point once you do get it at that, that level. Uh, now, I have to admit that I live in the Queen Anne area, so I'm one of those people. And I, I visited the Queen Anne store with my daughter, and she chose your, I think it's called Scout Mint. So this is my daughter. <laughs> so cute. And she was just, she, I surprised her that we were going there after preschool, and she absolutely loved it. And as we were leaving, she just was, we were on the street together, and she just put her hands up in the air and she said, I love Molly Moon. <laughs> You're probably used to that kind of reaction from kids. I'm very popular with the under five crowd. <laughs> what does that translate into? Just good sales, or do you feel like you've sort of building some kind of special relationship? Well, run, I, run for something? office, and they all turn 18. It'll really work out for me, right? That's exactly right. <laughs> so um, you have done something quite amazing. You've, you've followed your passion, something that you've loved all your life. You've been, sounds like you have success right off the bat, and it embodies your values. Do you think that you actually have a teachable lesson for other people who are considering entrepreneurialism? Can you teach what, can you teach your success? I think there are lessons to be learned. I don't know that anyone can replicate what I've done um, with their own passions, but I think, gosh, that's hard for me. I don't really like giving advice yeah. that much. Um, I think for the most part, it is good to follow what you believe in, and it's great to make something other than money your first bottom line. Well, the money has to make sense, but I don't think it should be your only motivator. Well, that's interesting because when you hear, especially big businesses talk, because they're held by shareholders and their first thing is to make money back for the shareholders, mm -hmm. profit has to be their motivation plus growth. But you're saying that profit doesn't necessarily need to be the first priority. Well, no. I. I I think that you do have a fiduciary, I have investors, I have a fiduciary responsibility to those investors, and I understand big businesses that say we have to make money, but you can make something else your goal, and financial reward can be an outcome of that. I think what we get frustrated in is that big businesses' only goal is money, and they don't really have a goal for serving their customers or serving their communities, that's where things get hard. Like, I can't see what the goal is for most insurance companies other than making money. Well, I think that's terrific, and I think we're beginning to hear more of that. Even Howard Schultz, CEO of Starbucks, recently said that he thought that profit should be tactical, which means that profit is the means to the end, that you should actually grow your company around the values. The money should actually make that happen. Obviously, you should make a profit, but it shouldn't be the overarching priority, and I think that's what I'm hearing here as well. Yeah. Well, that's great. So when you um, look at your long-range plan, I mean, you've been very successful. You're growing your storefronts. This could go on for a while. For many entrepreneurs, the ultimate, especially here in the Wild West, is the payout, right, to sell out to a larger company and, and, and go off. And, you know, this happened to Ben & Jerry's with Unilever bought them out. Have you thought about your legacy? Yeah, I have no exit plan. I love running my company. I love creating jobs. One of my big goals now is each year that I write a strategic plan for the company, how many jobs can our projects create? And that gives me a lot of fulfillment. It gives me a lot of joy. And I feel like I'm the best to run the company to embody you know, the progressive values on which I founded it. And I can't see not being involved in the company. I'm, I know I'll have to grow it and have other people make decisions and delegate, but I'll probably be involved my whole life. So if you're there for life, 
I hate to take you this far. <laughs> what would you like, what would you, I mean, say 100 years from now. Mm -hmm. What do you think about Molly Moon 100 years from now? Can it be run by somebody else? Can it still exist or is it just you? I'm sure it could exist. I don't really know the answer to that question. I mean, yeah. hopefully I've got another 60 years or so in Absolutely. me. Absolutely, especially all that healthy ice cream. Yeah. And, and how many people do you actually employ right now? Uh, I employ about 60 people. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a heck of a contribution. Do you feel like maybe you're making more of a contribution to the values now than you were in your 20s because you are embodying these values and bringing profit in the, to the economy itself? Um, I think it's hard to compare. Like. I think what I was contributing to the world in my 20s working in politics was, you know, we registered 90,000 young voters who ended up helping win the Democrats' elections in 2006. That's I feel like that's a little bit bigger impact than the ice cream, but you know, we'll my see daughter, where I my can daughter take would it. beg to differ. Yeah. <laughs> so when we return, who would give up a sure thing of a career in medicine to pursue photography? Our next guest did, and by successfully doing so, he has helped us see the world in his own unique way. The digital revolution has turned communications upside down. It poses challenges and opportunities to professionals seeking to influence and persuade. These are our students in the Master of Communication and Digital Media program innovators who think entrepreneurially about how to engage communities through storytelling. As creative leaders, together we're charting the future of communication. Want to join us? Find out more at mcdm.uw.edu. You need an innovator's heart to be a professional photographer in the digital age. When we all have cameras in our pockets, how do you get companies to pay for your images? Chase Jarvis has shot for Apple, REI, and Nike for over a decade, even as he connects the old world of media with the new. His YouTube channel, Chase Jarvis Live, has nearly 8 million views. He's one of the first professional photographers to film high-definition video on an SLR camera. And Chase's Seattle 100 book profiles creative people, groups, and companies who have collectively contributed more than $13 billion to the local economy. Chase, welcome. Thank you so much, Hanson. It's a pleasure. So you once even wrote a book called The Best Camera is the One With You. So how on earth do you make a living when we all have these cell phone cameras? Well, actually, that was that was the idea behind it. Um, You're trying to put yourself out of business? Yeah, well, that, that seems like it's not all about business. There's a, there's a bigger cause behind it and, and the idea that a, a more creative world is a better world. So uh, that's one of the things that I found very, very early on when I started noticing that cameras were started having, or a phone started having cameras in them. Um, they were notoriously referred in my industry as crap. And, um, and why would anyone want those things? But I noticed that I always had one of these with me. And that's a, it's an important thing to think about when you're an artist because if you are limited when you can create by what sort of tools you have with you, you know, that's, that's a limitation. And, and as like even when the iPhone first came out, that was a really, really important thing for me because I realized that, hey, I'm standing, I can create just while I'm standing in line waiting for coffee. I started doing that and sharing those images every day. And lo and behold, the goal was trying to get people to think, if I could, wait, wait a minute, if I could get people to think and we're talking how many people have cell phones, and you can see that they're all gonna have cameras in the near future, we can instantly activate a world of literally six billion photographers. So this is great, and I love this as an academic, yeah. but I can imagine a marketing executive at one of these corporations saying, you know what? We don't need Chase and his fee anymore. Let's just go get a few hundred people and get their cell phone cameras out and capture some images. So, well, I think that's a fair assumption. But the idea that behind my approach is, is really a rising tide floats all the boats sort of, a, of approach. And, uh, and I think there's, in large part, these professional circles that I travel in uh, are, are a meritocracy. And if I'm encouraging the world to be artists in and of their own right, then hopefully it'll drive me to a better place to become a, a better artist and a bit more creative in my own right. So that was the uh, that's the idea, and I hope that when in doing so that we created this this bed of of artists that are also considering themselves to be creative. And in fact, it's, if, if that's the key, um, mm -hmm. you actually ratcheted up the level of professionalism and even the technology. Like even today, you spent some time 
with a, a really expensive device that you can't necessarily fit in your pocket, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, a hundred and fifty thousand dollar Phantom camera doesn't necessarily fit in your back pocket or fit in the average bank account. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm as a creative, I'm interested in exploring a variety of tools and the work that I did to try and get the world to think about uh, the the things that are in our devices that we we talked on to try and get them to think of that as a camera was a was a big challenge, but one that didn't have a lot of barrier. It was really a flip of a switch in the mind, and, and lo and behold, I was effectively put out the first, that, that best camera's the one that's with you, was the world's first book of, of uh, mobile phone pictures, so. Yeah, and this camera itself is not particularly expensive. I saw you walked in with a four thirds, a micro four thirds uh -huh. camera. These are sort of like the new wave of interchangeable lens cameras. Yep. Not as expensive as SLRs, better than point and shoots. I'm actually was very surprised that a person of your stature in the industry would actually have uh, a relatively amateur camera like this. Wow, well, hey, look, the, uh, the idea of, of a professional traveling the world, I, I travel 150,000 miles a year and go to some amazing locations, so often with a really large crew. Um, to create commercial imagery, whether that's moving pictures in the form of a commercial or still pictures. And at the end of that, you know, one, two, or three week process, we're in New Zealand with 50, 60 people, and we create one or two pictures. That, that world of creativity versus me with my iPhone, like I ultimately can feel more creative with my iPhone. And that's a weird thing as a professional, and that's been your livelihood and, and how you've, you've worked so hard to get to that level that ultimately this $300 thing that's in my pocket gives me the sort of feelings that that uh, are really closest and nearest and dearest to the fundamental creativity. So, so freedom and no expectations, just the ability to connect right to the universe. Yes, yeah, right? and, and at a moment's notice. And again, the, with the, the mantra that it's always with us, that, you know, that the best camera is the one that's with you. That to me underscores creativity in the, the proper sense more than, than traveling the world and doing super fancy stuff with super fancy people and super fancy gear. So the little four-thirds cameras, like I love to run around with one of those things. It's great. So Sounds great. I total, I'm totally with you, right? But you still right. do the business stuff. Right? You course. still run around with the stars, sure. but you also believe in connecting to the, the creative soul that you are. Uh, how do you balance those two? Um, I follow my heart, to be honest with you. It sounds a little bit cheesy, maybe trite, but... Uh, there's no, no, no two ways about it. I, I make a living as a creative, and for that, there's a business component to it. I've managed to surround my, myself with some business folks that are really, really good at that, that part of it. Um, but at the end of the day, what matters to me, what I want to go to my grave with, is you know, how, much, how much change did you bring to the world? How much growth? How much vision? Uh, and that necessarily doesn't come through the most creative or the most uh, commercial channels. Sometimes it does, you know. Uh, there was a commercial aspect to that iPhone thing, for example. I made an iPhone app that was the first app in the world to share direct to social networks. Well, now every photo app shares to social networks, and there's hundred, there's probably fifty thousand of those sorts of of, uh, of apps in the in the iTunes App Store. But it, it, at its core, it's not a commercial project. It's yeah. it's it's a it's a a personal vision of trying to, to change the world and disrupt things. Not for the sake of being a disruptor, but I do enjoy a little, you know, making a mess of things, so. <laughs> Did you ever regret not going to med school? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, not. Not for one second. Why I, did you make that switch? I mean, because I think a lot of people... You just listen to me talk, right? Well, it's no, obvious, this is great. You're right? lucky. You're, I mean, you're, you're lucky and you're talented. A lot of people get stuck in jobs and careers they don't love, but they felt that that was the thing they had to do. Right. So how do they find the courage and the inspiration to walk away to really follow their heart like you did? Wow, I, I can say it wasn't easy because we do, we, do, we live in a... a an age wrought with social pressure, right? There's a lot of, you want to be the best you can be, you need to be uh, sometimes this or that, um, what your parents, you want to please your friends, you want to, and at the end of the day, when, say, you're lying in your deathbed, are you going to really hope that you pleased a lot of other people? That, of course, you want to make these people happy, but it's your life, you get one chance at it, and that was really the way I looked at my educational career. Uh, you know, I thought I was going to be a doctor because that's what successful people become. You know, that was really, it was this reverse mindset that was, it was really disturbing after I finally wrapped my head around it. You know, when I was a young person, very impressionable, and, and I started flirting with philosophy as an undergraduate. I ended up getting a degree in philosophy in, in parallel with all the, the pre-med stuff. And I was actually in an interview at the University of Washington, and that is when I realized that this, I'm, this is the step where if I start saying yes to things like this, then I have to really commit time, energy, money, my parents' money, student loans, and towards a thing that is just not me, and I know it's not me. Were you a success right off the bat as a photographer? 
Um, you know, I think I used a 10-year overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> um, How did you get good? You get good from taking a lot of pictures, Hanson. Really? Yeah. Did to... you ever sort of sit there starving, eating a can of tuna, and saying, "Wow, I should have gone to med school"? Never said I should have gone to med school. I did sit there eating a can of tuna, saying, "Wow." <laughs> I'm eating a can of tuna. <laughs> wow, I'm eating a can of tuna. <laughs> and uh, but I loved it more than anything because when you're on the path toward your life's passion, it doesn't matter. It right? doesn't matter at all. You're you're really comfortable with the with, with whatever life might throw at you. So. And so once you've uh, overcome that first challenge of actually getting on your path. Mm -hmm. How do you keep it all going? How do you keep the muse happy? That is a great question, and one for me that has, um, it's loaded, because if there is a passion that's driving you, the way I personally look at it as these challenges, these hurdles that come up, they're really there to keep other people out who don't want it as much as I do. Now that's something, I don't know if I'm hardwired for that, but that's something that I believe very, very, very deeply, and. Um, when I come up with the challenge, I'm thinking, okay, this is going to suck because I have to go around this, over this, through this, whatever. I never look at it as a, this is a showstopper for me. And so you never I, let it get you down. You sort well, of see yeah, this is something that's going to make me better. No, I, don't, I also don't want to say that I don't always have this perfect, you know, I, I'm living in some sort of a, a, a fake world. But I do know that what, when I'm, you know, I'm on this earth, that's one of the things I was meant to do is to create stuff and that there are other people I also necessarily don't don't want to think that the pie is only so big and that we're all competing it's not a zero-sum game so that by my achieving a goal or getting over a hurdle to a creative success doesn't necessarily mean that somebody else is not going to but if given something that I am racing for with some against somebody else in a, in a commercial sense for whatever reason then I'm just driven by my passion and I believe that maybe uh, my passion which is ultimately one of the things that measures how hard or how far we're willing to go, is is pretty hardcore. So I, I love your website because it's not a brochure for Chase Jarvis. It's actually a ton load of useful, relevant content if you're interested in being a creative or being a photographer. And I print out one of my favorite blog posts of yours, and I actually subtitle it Chase's Ten Commandments. <laughs> so All ten right. things Let's every get into it. ten things every creative person that's you must learn. And this is this one that's really stood out for me is don't aim for better, aim for different. Why? Wow, I think um, well, there's, a, there's a little bit packed in there, but incrementally better, which is what, it, you know, if you can shoot uh, a picture with this many lights and then I can shoot one with this many plus one, um, that really doesn't define or shape the marketplace. It, I mean, we're driving innovation a little bit with that idea, but the idea about being a, a, a creative in, in any capacity, whether a fine artist or a, or a commercial, is that you have to take a picture or make something that no one else in the world can make. That's the, that is really something that's going to make jaws drop and make people stop and look at your work, whatever it is, whether it's film or photography or painting, anything. If you can do stuff that no one else is doing, then you've actually done something, in my opinion, interesting. Because the first ever is in the world, the first person to swim across the Atlantic Ocean, the first person to jump out of an airplane, these firsts, I think, are really interesting. And one of the ways that you can get to this first, one of the most, the, the most direct ways to get to first evers or unique perspectives is in here. I think so many people think that the art is out there, but really I'm trying to map my personal experience onto the world because there's nobody in the world that sees the world the way I do. And that's interesting. So can you verbalize your unique perspective? For example, if you were a... Uh, a musician, sure. and you were being categorized, and I hate to do this to you, no, no, in, in a music store. Sure. And if you look at your pictures, what, how would somebody cate generally characterize your view of the world through your lens? Um, I think there was, there's a certain grit to it, a certain sort of fundamental reality. It's sort of like a, a little bit of a stylized reality, um, and that I'll put some, I'll put a little magic dust on what is ultimately fundamentally a very, very real photograph. I aim um, in, in fine, art work, fine art work and in commercial work, I aim for the unmoment rather than the moment. And those unmoments are characterized by what feels right to me. I never, I mean, the best portraits in the world are never ones where there's someone sitting there smiling at the camera with the lamp and the, you know, the little velour chair. It's like, it's never the, the most. It's in, when they think the camera's off, right? Yeah, and yeah. The, I mean, think of, you know, the most influential pictures in, our, in the world, Eddie Adams' photograph of, in Vietnam uh, of the execution, um, you see the like the Ali standing over um, his fallen opponent. You see um, Warhol staring directly into the camera. For example, all those all those are not posed moments. And so even in 
times where I'm shooting photographs of people who know I'm shooting, I do anything I can to throw them just a little bit off balance in the best way. And that I think that's what we saw with in your Seattle 100 book, which you got here. You've got these incredible personalities from a diversity of backgrounds, and there's that amazing improvisational energy there somehow. How do you capture that? That is, I mean, that's exactly what I'm talking about. That's me trying to sort of throw my, I know a lot of, a lot of artists, I'm going to qualify this, a lot of artists, they, they, they describe themselves as, as observers and they don't want to interact with the subject because they might taint them and, or whatever. My approach tends to be different. Like I, I want to participate in a moment with them where if I'm aware, if they're aware I'm with the camera or not, there's there's something where they'll catch me looking at them with a camera, and if I can capture that moment in a way that nobody else can, either through the previous ten minutes of us spending time together, or through me being in the right place at the right time and getting that great that great moment where their eyes actually catch the glass, then that's me sort of. It's, it's me trying to ascribe my will a little bit into the moment. And, and when uh, my will matches the will of the subject, sometimes actively, sometimes pass passively, there tends to be this cool, this cool Can chemistry. Can you tell when that happens? Oh, yeah. Is there something like a light bulb or you sort of feel the energy flow through you? It's a little bit of both. There's a, there's a, a feeling that I have that's very, very clear. Like I, and it's usually like, I'm pretty sure I just got that. <laughs> just nailed it. And, yeah. <laughs> I, you got your hammer back? Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but there's also, um, and I usually keep shooting because, you know, sometimes we can continue to elevate through a, a portrait session. Like, for an example, the Seattle 100, I shot a lot of pictures there. Um, but yeah, there's, there's uh, and, and visually, you know, nowadays with digital, a lot of the work that I do is, is in the digital world. And you can go back and look and see that you've got that. Um, it doesn't make me want to stop shooting. I never say, oh, I'm spent, and throw the camera up in the air like something you see in Hollywood, and his assistant runs around and catches the camera. But like that, there's a, there is a moment of intimacy between um, photographer and photography, between subject and, and, and shooter, that I can't really explain until you, you've lived it. It's very, very hard, but it, it's, there's something intimate Approaching, approaching like uh, just human touch. How intimate that is when you really captured someone in a place that that is is beautiful. And you made a living from it, which is incredible. Yeah, I do. I pinch myself every day. <laughs> I just came from a shoot, and the fact that I'm on this side of the camera with you now, all of this is is very surreal for me. So thanks a lot. Well, thank you. And so you've heard from Molly Moon at the peak of entrepreneurship, and just now Chase Jarvis at the peak of innovation. When we return, we'll bridge these peaks together. We'll discuss how to harness your creative values and make a living without selling out. Welcome back. I'm with ice cream purveyor Molly Moon and photographer Chase Jarvis. So, um, guys, there is a, a great article reviewing Seattle 100 in the Seattle Times that says, it's as if you've been walking down the same street your whole life without ever stopping to acknowledge the people that pass you by, then suddenly realizing every one of them has something fascinating to talk about. I think that was a really nice way of sort of looking at these people in here. And Molly is one of the people in the book. That's the big reveal of the That's show That's the big today. reveal, <laughs> yeah. So we're going to open it up. But great. maybe while I'm trying to find the page, which I think Molly knows by heart, which is 17. 17. <laughs> um, why did you choose Molly? Oh, that's pretty much a no-brainer. If you have to ask that, you haven't been paying attention because <laughs> she I mean, even introduced her as ice cream purveyor. I would more call her ice cream princess um, or empress, <laughs> if you will. Um, no, like the 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 underscore the under underlying driving principle for Seattle 100 was people who are driving culture in Seattle. And Seattle, whether you people know it or believe it or not, is is an amazing food city. And food comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And even the fact that, that Molly was willing to break out and do something, ice cream in Seattle where the average temperature is like 48 degrees, <laughs> like that is innovative in and of itself, but the way that she did it with local ingredients and, and did it out in front, like to me that's beautiful, that's driving, driving culture, driving food culture. So speaking of beautiful Molly, how do you think Chase captured you? I loved the photo shoot. The experience was really fun too. Like the first thing Chase and his crew did was offer me a drink as soon as I walked into the studio. And, you know, they made me up, I got hair and makeup, and it was a super fun afternoon. It was the first summer that my Wallingford shop had been opened. 
And so I had, I was coming from the ice cream kitchen. I smelled like waffle cones and chocolate. I was actually kind of covered in cocoa powder. I loved it. And um, it was a break from, you know, turning the ice cream. And it was a really fun day. I loved the way the photos ha have turned out. And what were you trying to capture of Molly when you sort of put her in that position? Well, I think that's, that's best told with the pictures. You know, yeah. the the. Molly came in. She is so good at what she does. She's really an amazing young entrepreneur. Um, she she's very captivating. She could sell. Uh, I don't know. Probably has sold, as they say, ice cream to uh, to the Eskimos or to the first people up in in Alaska, um, because you're so passionate about your story. And I wanted to capture that focus. But there's a sassiness about her that you, you can tell just by sitting across. I, I'm know. trying to contain the sassiness. <laughs> but so those are, I mean, those are things that we wanted, you know, she had her dog with her and I thought that was just an amazing uh, sort of sidekick, if you will, because you guys seemed like two peas in a pod. So um, it was pretty organic too. I think we shot a lot of pictures of you because it was, you were uh, really photogenic, so. Oh, thanks. That's the so, way it unfolds. So yeah. that passion of Molly, that passion of creativity, which is really embodied in this book, is actually also measurable from an economic point of view as well. The Seattle city of Seattle actually put together a study recently that you were part of saying that this actually has an impact. What's the bottom line that we should know about creativity and people like Molly and what they do for us? Well, I think the first thing, and again, and with, at the risk of sounding trite, it's, it's, it, all of this was born from pure passion. What Molly does with food and with ice, with ice cream, um, it's, it's born out of her loving it. And me with art and, and, and creativity, trying to do this project because I was so passionate about the city that which I was born and, and raised. And the city noticed this particular project and after some, I don't know, I'd been out for a while and I, I got a call from the mayor's office and said, you know, could we interview? We like this project, it's interesting, we want to learn a little bit more about what you did, about the curation of the list and, and we want to look at it from an economic standpoint. So they funded a study that uh, had been going on for about a year and just wrapped and, and was released not too long ago that says something that, again, work or art is meant to do work, in my opinion. It's meant to turn heads, stop people, get people to think and act. And you can't always predict what that work's going to be. Uh, in this case, again, the, the mayor's office undergoing this study it came back with what I think is a really cool finding that the economic impact on the region is really, really serious. In fact, I think of the, the categories that I did, did sort of brought out in the book, they account for, and these being the leaders of those categories, food and, and entrepreneurialism and sports, for example, they contribute 13 and a half billion dollars to the regional economy and 170,000 jobs. And that's, you know, culture, creativity, and and I think if you pulled the the largely the, if the you pulled the region, you wouldn't think that. Yeah. And so this revealing of of how impact how culture impacts our economy is something that is new, and that's something that that the world can get behind, that the mayor can get behind, and say, wait a minute, here we're all trying to track down big business. Like, what about funding at a grassroots level? that like the culture culture is our region's new natural resource hmm. how do you feel about that you how does, how does that square with your business and philosophical objectives being part of that and hearing that framed that way molly i mean i super support the premise and i believe the study absolutely i think that um correct me if i'm wrong chase but there was an economic impact state statement or study done on the just the music industry five or maybe seven years ago that said some pretty similar things and absolutely culture is a huge part of our economy and when you take culture and food and if you want to put culture and food together um, out of an economy there is a lot left on the table and there are a lot of jobs you know the service industry just in in food, there are a lot of jobs being created every day by this, you know, surge in the foodiness of Seattle. And I don't think that's to be taken lightly. So how do we cultivate that? In fact, Molly, you just recently got back from a trip to D.C. where you were invited to sit on a presidential committee about some of this, Sweet. right? Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> what was that all about? Uh, the mayor's office actually sent several business leaders from Seattle to a day talking with White House administration staff 
about job creation and they were it was really impressive and and the administration staffers were saying what can we do to help you business leaders create more jobs what governmental barriers can we help remove and then they also did quite a bit of education letting us know what they are doing what they have been working on and some of the resources that we might not know about as business owners that we should be tapping into one of the more fascinating ones i thought was a new tax credit from the obama administration for every unemployed veteran that we hire oh, wow. and it's a significant wow. tax credit and it's i think it's for, just for vets um like post 9 11 vets and it's made me think I'm going to go find <clears throat> a Veterans Affairs office to match my jobs this year with some of their candidates and see if, if we can't hire a few vets. And I think that feels really good. It adds a diversity to my company that I'd love, and there's a tax credit involved. So um, it was really educational. And I also felt like the administration was really listening to business leaders from Seattle. See, that's terrific, Chase, to hear that at the national level, to see that value and that connection and sort of bring it right back down. When you think about it from a local level then and sort of capturing this and recognizing that it is the natural resource you call it, what else can we do to cultivate and sustain this amazing economic impact? Well, I think we need to drive more culture. And that's one of the reasons that some of the basic tenets that, that my sort of life mission is about is about the democratization of creativity and its processes, you know, that's why. And, that's why you don't mind the cell phone camera even though you use the camera to make a living from it. Yeah, absolutely, and that was a, a big a big uh, plan. It was very, very intentional to try and make more people creative. My, my 65-year-old mother is a great example. She'd been told her whole life that you're either neutral or not creative, and you know, I put an iPhone 1 in her hand and, and then made an app for her that she started shooting with, and suddenly she herself felt incredibly empowered. Her friends noticed, like, wow, your, your photos on Facebook are always the coolest. They've been, and, and that, you know, if you take that idea and you extrapolate it across millions or billions of people, um, that has that raises the level that gets people more engaged and and the creativity that I'm not that I'm talking about is not just photography or filming or painting or whatever it's there's a ton of creativity in business what Molly's done with business there's creativity in uh, sustainability in policy there's creativity in every walk of life and that's really what this you know what who who are the people who are driving culture. There's a lot of the people in here. In fact, that was one of the sort of criteria. The central criterion was how creative is what it is, what, what is it that they're doing, hmm. and so creativity permeating all these things like that's that's mission critical for a healthy economy, for a forward-looking, um, you know, uh, populace on any level, national, global, national, or or local. So that said, then Molly, uh, from a very practical point of view, as a businesswoman, even the report states this very clearly. The city is very process heavy and very light, light on just doing it. We're progressive in spirit, but not in action. In fact, we had one of our first shows was with Lee Canlis, who's also in this yeah. book, about Seattle nice. That Seattle's a really nice place, but just doesn't know how to really execute in the end because either we're too polite or too passive aggressive or whatever else. Have you encountered that kind of spirit that sort of, sort of makes things a little hard to get things done sometimes? Honestly, I don't know that I have. I mean, I think that starting my business was surprisingly easier than I thought it would be. And being able to be creative and have creativity received well in this city has been pretty easy and really fun. And I haven't felt a lot of barriers to execution at all. And I, I see creative people executing all around me. So I don't know. So you feel like the... There, that people are rising to the occasion to sort of hit that level. I mean, Chase, have you seen that? Because that struck me as a very stark, self-revelatory observation from the city of Seattle. Yeah, well, I think the idea about it is that there, it tends to operate in silos. And I don't think that's Seattle necessarily in and of Seattle. It's, it's a sort of a global phenomenon and trying to break down some of those barriers because we've tended to hang out with the people that we run with. Architects hang out with architects, filmmakers hang out with filmmakers. And that's one of the things that this book was uh, aiming to do is trying to break down some of those barriers. I, would, I mean, even on the particular days that I was shooting, I would bring in, say, Molly and then and then a Dennis Hayes, you know, who's who's founder of Earth Day, you know, and and there's some crossover there, but not the same. And and that idea, I think, 
is, is one that can challenge a little bit of this notion that you brought up here. I believe that we're a city of doers. It's not the shoegazing sort of place that people talk about it being. And, and you know, this trying to break down that idea. And sure, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people who wish they were doing more. I wish I was doing more. You always probably, you guys probably do as well. But that's not the pattern that I see. I see um, butt kicking and innovation, and that's what we should celebrate. It's our thing. It's the thing we do best. Well, that's interesting because you mentioned silos. Even Four Peaks is meant to break down those barriers of, of these four elements: innovation, entertainment, community, and um, entrepreneurship. The, this report does say this talk about this cross pollinate cross pollinization that people, the one, members of the Seattle 100, actively choose to locate to this region and deliberately stay oftentimes despite more lucrative opportunities to pursue similar work in other locations. So that there is that going on. People mm -hmm. can be elsewhere, but they sort of see this collaborative spirit here and they can be part of that. You could, you've could you been in Idaho and Montana and you're, you're a breakout success. You must have thought that, you know, I could maybe go to San Francisco or New York with my ice cream. I actually lived in San Francisco um, in when I was working in politics. I ran Music for America from San Francisco for a few years and worked kind of splitting my time between San Francisco, New York, and Seattle. And when I knew I wanted to get out and live somewhere permanently, there was no question that it was Seattle or bust. Wow. Yeah. Well, there's, isn't there a, there's a great study, I think it was, uh, was it the Wall Street Journal? Said that Seattle and Washington, D.C. are neck and neck with the most desirable place for young people to, to move to. And it's because of our innovation, because of our arts and culture. And I think that's a fascinating thing that we should you know, maintain that, stick that stake in the ground and wave that flag and, and continue to draw you. I mean, you said it's Seattle yeah. bust, right? Yeah. And there's a reason that I was more familiar, arguably, with, with New York and Paris than I was with Seattle when I made this book. Despite having lived here, I needed to get into the paint and get my hands dirty. Hmm. So if we're talking about breaking down the silos and helping each other out, Molly, is there a particular challenge you're facing right now that you could share with us that we could sort of try to brainstorm and figure out that we, how we can help you fix it? Oh, my God. Some, some more ice cream? <laughs> that can how about ice cream sales in January? No, I'm yeah. kidding. Um, <laughs> or vice versa. We can go to Chase first, too, if you no, want. I, I like it. Uh, okay. In her court. Um, gosh, you're really putting me on the spot. Something that I would like help with. Um, I have a book coming out next month or in April, and I've never done that. Do you have any advice for me? I do. I, the advice that I have would be to not necessarily rely on your publisher. I'm sure you have a great publisher, yeah. um, which uh, I think I know who it is. But, um, I don't want to run the risk of blowing it. So, um, But they won't have all the answers for marketing your book. So I think you are a great marketer to be able to get out there and push a book in a way that you want it. Um, I would suggest socially, you know, use social networks and a lot of the fabric of your friends to help you spread the word. And, and as one of your friends uh, with a reasonable size social following, I'll, I'll pimp that book because oh, ice cream, <laughs> who's not going to get love for sharing ice cream? You know? I have a, a kind of a funny story about how we are promoting the book that is in a very different way. So I was trying to do that, use the Rolodex, be creative, and I knew that the CEO of Sur La Tab, the kitchen store, yeah. all over the country was following me on Twitter and I couldn't get through to someone at Sur La Table to see if they would carry my book so I just tweeted at him nice and asked him to go to lunch with me and he got right back to me and said he'd love to I ended up taking him to Sitka and Spruce for lunch nice moves, man. and Sur La Table is carrying my book in all 92 stores and rolling out a line of 10 Molly Moon's products this wow. year. Wow. Well, you are Molly Moon, after all. I would Boom. respond to you as well immediately on Twitter as well. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. So, yeah, using your networks and social media and being creative and being courageous with reaching out paid off. All right. Chase, your turn. Great. Challenge. Uh, my challenge is uh, I think that the group of people that you surround your, yourself with is arguably some of the most important things in life because it have, helps you learn, helps you achieve. And so I would ask, my challenge is always trying to meet new people. And so my challenge or my request of you is someone in your network is someone that I should really know and maybe you could help me meet that person. Maybe even it's even the CEO of Sir the Tom. <laughs> sure. No, anything, there's some, something, something interesting and creative that I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect. Is there, anything, right. is, there, is there a way for you to make that happen? Do you think, if you think of who Chase's circles are, can you break him out of his 
his comfort zone, you think, with people you know? I'm very nervous. Because you already stole your Rolodex, apparently. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll have to think on that, because, yeah, no, no. you know, I, I think half my friends are in that book, so I'm going to have to really dig deep. <laughs> hey, let's, let's go as, as big as you can think. I'm happy, <laughs> happy to go there. Well, I think that's a good place to conclude our conversation. Chase Jarvis, Molly Moon, thank you for sharing your vision on how to profit from passion. When we return, Media Space, reclaiming my content, why I'm resetting my relationship with social media. And now let's switch into the media space. I read recently that personal data is the oil of the digital age. All those personal stories that we share online have value and serve as currency, except that we so freely surrender them in return for Facebook and Google. Somehow, we see these services as a fair trade for the precious commodity that is our online behavior. I've long considered how social media platforms facilitate content distribution. I enjoy sharing my photos, films, and stories, but I've only just begun to think about who's profiting most from my creativity, and I don't like what it adds up to. Facebook lays claim to the content that we do share with overly complicated terms of service. They want to make it easier for us to give it all away, to be as public as possible. As the company itself goes public, we now see that our personal data is worth billions of dollars to it. So. I deleted my original Facebook profile a few weeks ago. I don't hate Facebook, I just don't trust it, or Google. I refuse to allow these social utilities to track my action throughout the web. If Facebook wants to make money off me, I think it's only fair that I should make something off of it. So I started a new account primarily for professional communication. If I do want to share content, I'll do so on platforms where my ownership rights are clear and not subject to royalty-free licenses or facial recognition algorithms. This has all inspired me to come up with my own terms of service. One, the content that I create is mine. Two, you may benefit from my personal data, but only the data that I expressly share with you. I get to use your service for personal or professional objectives. You get some of my data. Three, I will generally only share things online that I would feel free to publicly express in a conversation, a lecture, or in writing. If I truly want to give it away, I'll do so under a Creative Commons license. For, in all other cases, you should pay me for the use of online me. As for me on Twitter, I'm HRH Media. On TV and in real life, I'm Hanson Hossein.